This is part three. The good news is there's no part four <laughs> or five or anything coming after that. Let's uh, look at Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 to 16. Verse 14 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud sat one like to the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth. And the earth was reaped. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we live in exciting in serious times in this earth's history. Issues for life or for death confront us, not just this life, but for, for all eternity. I just humbly ask your spirit would be here in our midst, your angels whispering truths in our ears, And I pray that you may be lifted up and exalted as redeemer of this world and as sovereign of all creation. In Jesus' name, amen. So John saw the second coming of Jesus there in vision on the island of, of Patmos. And what he heard and saw just prior to this is what we've been looking at um, the past couple times. And that's Revelation chapter 14, backing up to uh, verse 9 and onward. And the third angel followed them. This is what John saw and heard just before the second coming of Jesus. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, whosoever receives the mark of his name. Now, there's a, an ancient saying I want to bring in right now, and, and that's this, that a text without a context is a pretext. And so the lingering question up till now is, what is your picture of God? If you look only at the third message of these three angels, look at this one alone, what kind of picture of God does it tell, uh, show you? What, what do you think? Is God a loving God? Or is the devil projecting his own attributes onto God to make him look like a vindictive tyrant? Context is vital for everything, especially when we're talking about the Bible and, and truths that it, that it shares. And so, 
there is a context of all three messages of the angels. The first angel, the second angel, and the third angel. And there is a common theme that connects all three of these together, like, like a thread of truth. The, the thing of it is, the word that describes this doesn't appear in any of these messages. And so what do you suppose that word is? Conscience. Conscience is the issue that's confronting all of us down here at the end of time. Believers, unbelievers, everybody. What is the state of your conscience? And what is the conscience? Well, it's, it's the link between God and us. It's the moral center of your mind. The conscience is the discerner of what is right and wrong, of what is truth and what is error. And so it's very vital that we understand the role of conscience in our walk with Jesus, in our life and witness in this world. And that brings us then to the first angel's message. It begins in chapter 14 and verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And so the everlasting gospel is where all three messages as a whole begins. Uh, once again, the overriding issue that confronts all of us down here at the end of time is this matter of worship. Worship's mentioned five times in chapter 13, all in reference to a dragon, a sea beast, and an earth beast. And then uh, again here in chapter 14. So the issue is, what is true worship? And what is false worship? It's something we need to know because it has eternal consequence for us. And then the question is, what is the everlasting gospel? Well, we have, we have um, studied previously that the everlasting gospel goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 the day that our first parents believed the lies of the devil and ate that piece of fruit. At that time, they had been in harmony with God's law and at hostility to everything the devil represents. But that got flipped on its head. So now they're in harmony with the devil and his ways, and they're in hostility to God's law. And so God came to the rescue. God told us in chapter 3 and verse 15 of Genesis that he would manifest himself in human flesh, become one with the human family, that he would live a life of obedience in harmony to God's law, that he would remain in hostility to the devil and his ways, and then offer himself for the sins of the whole world. John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Peter tells us in his first letter in chapter 2 and verse 24, that Jesus himself bore all of our guilt, all of our sins collectively in his own person, in his own body on the tree. 
and paid the penalty for that. So if he took our guilt, how much do we have? How much guilt did you walk in with today? How much guilt will you walk out with? We notice this little statement from a, a book that's called Faith and Works on page 103. As the penitent sinner, contrite before God, discerns Christ's atonement in his behalf and accepts this atonement as his only hope in this life and the future life, his sins are pardoned. And this is justification by faith. Amen. Justified. Break down that word. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God sees us. It, this is a declaration of what righteousness by faith is all about. The statement goes on then, every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will and keep in a state of repentance and contrition, exercising faith in the atoning merits of the Redeemer and advancing from strength to strength, from glory to glory. Notice, we are to keep in a state of repentance and contrition. This is not optional for the Christian. And this is the role of the conscience in our Christian life. When it brings to us conviction of something wrong we've done, that's not the time to hide from God like Adam and Eve did. It's the time to run to him and say, Lord, I messed up. Please forgive me and, and give me victory over this. So we're to be in a state of a continual repentance toward God. Uh, and conscience plays a vital role in this. It's something that the Apostle Paul talked about several times in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 24, in verse 16, this is what he said. He's, he testified, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. So question. If you have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man, isn't that another way of, of saying that you are obedient by faith, that you love God supremely, and that you love others impartially? If our conscience is void of offense, then this is what we're doing. We're loving, loving God as Lord of our lives and loving others, just the way that God had purpose for us to live. And then Paul goes deeper into this concept of the conscience in Hebrews chapter 9. In the book of Hebrews, Paul is arguing, not in an argumentative way, he's, he's showing us how Jesus had accomplished his role on earth as the uh, sacrifice for the sins of the world, and now having ascended to heaven, he is the mediator, um, interceding on our behalf, ministering his blood on our behalf. And so he says here in chapter 9, beginning at verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, Christian life is good things to come, friends. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not to say of this building referencing the temple that still existed in Paul's day. So we have a mediator, and only one, and it's Christ Jesus, our Lord. In verse 12, Paul goes on, 
neither by the blood of, of goats and calves, but it's by his own blood that he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is the substitutionary sacrifice that Jesus made for all of you, even for me. Skip down to verse 14 now. And he says, in view of Jesus having done all this, then he says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? All of us at one time or other in our lives, and multiple times perhaps, we've had a troubled conscience, a guilty conscience, something that's telling us we're not right with God. And it's, it's the work of Jesus to purge our conscience of, of this guilt, but then also purges of all the, the little things that we might do to appease a troubled conscience. You know, we might give more money or, or um, buy food for somebody. Those are, those are good works, but they don't commend us to God. So if our conscience is purged of guilt, then we're, then we're set free. We have liberty of conscience and a conscience that's accountable to God alone. So that takes us into the next verse of the first angel's message. And the command there is to fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So in view of the everlasting good news that God has for us, in view of his ability to set our conscience at liberty, what are we to do? Well, we're to fear God. Be afraid of God? No. No. To honor God with our life. Honor him as Lord and Savior. We're to give glory to him. If you, um, if you were to go to the book of uh, Joshua in chapter 7 and verse 19, you'll see there what giving glory to God is all about. And in a few words, it's that we confess our, our sins, our, our faults to God and, and seek repentance. We want to turn away from the objectionable things of our life, of our makeup, and turn toward Jesus. And then uh, and then we're to worship God. Well, worship is one of God's laws. Bible tells us by beholding we become changed into the same image. So behold Jesus in his word. Behold how he uh, interacted with people. Those that agreed with him. Those that loved him. Those that opposed him. And those that sought to take his life. Study how he interacted with these people. The more we are beholding Jesus, the more we become like him. So this message also tells us about a sign of God's authority, does it not? You see the words there that go right to uh, Exodus chapter 20 and the, and the fourth commandment. And please understand, we are here because we're supposed to be. Amen? Amen? But a day of worship is a sign. It's a sign of a greater reality. It's a sign of the reality that God's about the business of restoring us to the children, the people that 
he is purpose for us to be. And he's bringing that out of us every day as we work, walk with him. So we go on to the second angel's message. There followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I'm going to try to fly through this so we get to the third angel's message. But um, Babylon, as we study chapter 14 and then chapters 16 to 18, we find that Babylon is a woman, an impure woman. And we also find that Babylon is a city. Uh, and we find that Babylon is a name, a moniker, if you will, for the dragon, the sea beast, and the earth beast of chapter 13, or as it's uh, related in chapter 16, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Babylon represents all of this. It represents the kind of worship that is defiant of God. It, it offers only a bloodless sacrifice. There's, there's no um, repentance from sin. There's no dealing with a guilty conscience. It's a clash of ideologies. Uh, there's defiance and oppression with Babylon. And there's freedom and life uh, with, with Christ. So, a bloodless sacrifice, no remission. We're, we remain dead in our sins in that, in that state. And, uh, and there's a mark of authority involved here as well. What is it that testifies who and what you worship? It's how we gather together. So, with God, we have liberty of conscience. With the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, we have the merging of church and state together. A woman riding the beast in Revelation 17. And they exist for the purpose of something that's called the common good. Theirs is a merging of kingdoms that is of this world. And I would remind you, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So please know the difference. And the last thing is that Babylon seeks to usurp God's role with the conscience. God speaks to us directly about what's right and wrong, of, of what we should do and not do. Babylon says, I will tell you what to think. I will tell you what to do. And if... if you need oppression, I will bring it. So, along with this, Paul was um, instructing his, his young protege, Timothy, in his first letter there in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. This is what Paul says. Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Hmm. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Don't we see that in Revelation 13 with the earth beast? Don't we see that again in chapter 16 with unclean spirits like frogs out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet working miracles? Moving on, uh, verse 2, Paul says that they speak lies 
in hypocrisy and have their conscience seared with a hot iron. God comes to us. His Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin. We're told that in John chapter 16, verse 9. And then when, when that happens, we have a decision. How are we going to deal with that? We can open up our hearts, seek forgiveness, and, and have cleansing from that. It's promised in, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Or we can close off our heart. We can harden our heart like, like Pharaoh did. And eventually you reach the point where your conscience is deaf. It will not hear the still small voice any longer. And that's a bad, bad place to be in. With the person with a conscience seared with a hot iron, there is no remission of, of sin. There's no faith in the atoning blood of Jesus. And a person like that, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2, is storing up wrath for the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. So now, finally, we get to the third angel's message. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. And here's where we bring the conscience into the third angel's message. Instead of a conscience that's liberated from guilt, we have a guilty conscience that's storing up wrath for the day of wrath. And the best way I can illustrate this is with the story of Herod Antipas and John the Baptist. You can read his story. The, the best uh, place to read that in the Gospels is in Mark chapter 6. But let me quickly recount the story. You know, John is, is um, the forerunner telling the people that the Messiah has come. It's time to clean up your act. Many believed him. Herod was among them. But his wife, Herodias, was, was livid. And why was that? Because Herod was already married to someone else, and so was Herodias, married to the half-brother of, of Herod. But, you know, desires have their way. And, and so Herod and Herodias became married. John called him out on that. He said, you're living in sin. And you don't want to do that. The outcome is, is not good. But Herodias insisted, have John arrested. So he was. And, and then I'll forego most of the story for the sake of time here, but in a banquet honoring Herod and uh, a gathering of all, all the high officials in, in Judea gathered there, the wine flowing, uh, the guard let down. Herodias sent, sends in 
her young daughter, Salome. Salome does a seductive dance for the men gathered there. They're overwhelmed with the experience. And Herod says, ask me what you want, Salome. I'll give you up to half my kingdom. You know what she asked for. And this troubled Herod the rest of his life. It was very sobering when Salome came back with the request. But Herod, for the sake of saving face, was not willing to give in. And he lived with a troubled conscience for the rest of his life. You can read in greater detail about this in a beautiful book on the life of Christ. It's called The Desire of Ages. And it's uh, chapter 22 in reference to the imprisonment and death of John. And uh, explaining what the account was all about there, then the author goes on to quote uh, Deuteronomy 28 verses 65 to 67. This is what Herod lived on an everyday basis till the day he died. Verse 65, and this, this is in the chapter of the blessings of, and the cursings that Moses told the children of Israel. If you are willing to walk with God and obey him, we'll bless you abundantly above all you could ask or think. If you, but if you disobey and you uh, become like the nations around you, these are the curses that would happen. And then uh, he brought it down to the personal level. Verse 65, he said, Among these nations you shall find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have any rest. But the Lord will give you there a trembling heart in fear of what? In fear of judgment and a failing of eyes and a sorrow of mind. In verse 66, and your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and shall have none assurance of your life. What a way to live. Verse 67, in the morning you shall say, oh, God, we're at evening, and at evening you shall say, Oh, God, if it were only morning, for the fear of your heart, wherewith you shall fear, and for the sight of your eyes, which you shall see. And then the author follows with these words. Please notice carefully. The sinner's own thoughts are his accusers. And there can be no torture keener than the stings of a guilty conscience which give him no rest day or night. Have you ever experienced that in your life? This is not talking about the sign of what the mark of the beast is. This is talking about the reality of what the mark of the beast is. It's an uncleansed, unrepentant conscience, something that troubles you every moment of every day down to your last breath. And so God is pleading with his children of every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. He's saying, please, come to Jesus before it's too late. And so, I close with what I hope are words of encouragement for you. It goes back to Paul in his letter to the Hebrews in chapter 10, uh, beginning at verse 19. And here Paul says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us 
through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We need a holy boldness, church. We need to share a true picture of God to the world around us. Verse 21, having a high priest over the house of God, so he encourages us, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our, our hearts sprinkled of what? Of from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The water of washing of the word. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, especially in these serious times we live in. For he, Jesus, is faithful that promised. And let us consider, let us consider one another to provoke one another to Anger? Resentment? No. Provoke one another to love and to good works. Let's encourage one another. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting, encouraging, imploring one another in fellowship and so much the more as we see the day approaching. How far off the horizon can that day be? How much more upside down does this world have to become? How much more does God have to do in your life and my life to make us all fit for heavenly places. He has a work to do in each of us, a work to do with each of us, and a work to do with us for the world around us. So let's stand firm in faith and trust Let's hold on to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And let's press together. Let's pray. Holy Father, you've offered your own life for the sake of saving people like us. You have made every provision for us to, to know your love personally and intimately. You've made possible for us to know that we are free from the guilt of our sin because Jesus bore it upon himself. And you've made provision to impart his life and his righteousness to us. Dear Father, help us take to heart your power to save, the shortness of time, and how, how we can cooperate with you to hasten the day of, of your return. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.